today I'm going to give a pretty broad overview. Some of this stuff is already covered this morning by, uh, in various aspects um, by Joel and Harard. But to the sort of, I want to give you a basic overview of what are the different kinds of approaches for creating galaxy populations in large simulations. What are the kinds of drivers, science drivers, that we have for these simulations and how accurate do they need to be? And then what are some of the ways that we might use simulations um, both now and in the era of having very large data sets? So today, I'm just going to focus on the basic motivation and some of the techniques, and then I'll get into some more details in these two lectures. So I want to start by just reminding us all what are the kinds of things we're trying to simulate. And some of this has been discussed already. Um, you heard a nice talk yesterday by Alex Soleil on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So just to remind you of the context of current and future surveys over the next decade. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey um, got spectra for about a million galaxies. Actually, I think Alex said it's now two million. Um, in the whole, I think DR9, which includes BOSS, is, is that roughly two million? OK. So the original uh, DR7 was closer to a million. About 200 million galaxies with photometry surveyed about a quarter of the sky. So it's enormous undertaking um, over a decade of, of real observations, actually probably for like almost three decades of, of work from conception. And I think one of the sort of amazing things about astronomy as it stands today is, is, is this survey, we're still almost scratching the surface of what Sloan can tell us about both galaxy evolution and cosmology. So I think there's still a lot of things that we can learn from uh, current data. So on the other end, we have very deep surveys um, of the universe, primarily from HST um, in the future from JWST, Euclid, uh, other deep surveys. So the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, just to give you the scale, right? there's about 10,000 galaxies in this quote unquote empty patch of sky. They explicitly chose an empty patch of sky and found 10,000 galaxies. This is one thinth of a millionth of the sky. <laughs> so it's a very, very small patch. That implies of order 100 billion galaxies to this depth. So that's the kind of thing that we would like to be able to understand. Um, Joel and Harard already mentioned the Candles project. This is the largest ever HST project. About a quarter of a million galaxies focused primarily on redshifts 1 to 8. And very deep multi-wavelength data. So um, the Candles uh, observation specifically is an HST project, but there's been lots of follow-up from all the way from the UV to the far IR in these same very, sorry, uh, including x-rays, um, in these same uh, five fields. And so very, very deep, uh, very broad wavelength coverage of these galaxies. Um, but again, we're looking at a very small piece of the sky, about one two hundred thousandth of the sky. Um, so the next step in, in, in the Sloan is the BOSS survey, um, which will get about, uh, little more than a million spectra, again, one quarter of the sky, primarily focused on red luminous galaxies at higher redshift than the main Sloan survey. Um, so this is particularly, it's motivated by getting large scale galaxy clustering to measure baryon acoustic oscillations, but has lots of other applications. Um, in the next decade, we're really going to see a whole flourishing of new surveys, primarily in the next several years, it will be imaging surveys, but hopefully followed by large spectroscopic surveys as well. So one of these uh, that I've been involved in since its inception is the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, this is a survey, uh, this is a camera that was built for an existing telescope, uh, the Blanco Telescope in Chile. And the camera is being installed now. Uh, first light for the camera should be uh, Technically, I think it's supposed to be September 28th on the current schedule. Um, and nominally, the survey would now start in mid-December and go on for about six years. So 
This survey will do 5,000 square degrees. That's an eighth of the sky. About two and a half magnitudes deeper than Sloan. So uh, about 24 in I band, um, a little bit deeper in R. And uh, there, so we expect to observe about 300 million galaxies. Um, there's also overlap with some near IR data and with the SPT survey, which, um, which will have Sanyayev Zeldovich measurements for all of the galaxy clusters. Um, so lots of things we're going to want to understand in this era. And then, of course, the next generation survey, which people are really starting to actively plan for, is the LSST survey. This is a new camera being built uh, for a new telescope. Uh, Alex already said a few words about this, but the idea is to image the sky every three nights. That's 30 terabytes per night of data that you get, um, about half the sky. And the idea is to get about 10 billion galaxies. Um, so it's about five magnitudes deeper than the imaging survey of Sloan. So that's just, that's just a few of them. There's a lot more large surveys that will be happening in the next decade, um, including, of course, surveys in, in other wavelengths, surveys of the gas content of the universe, and then hopefully large spectroscopic surveys um, that will happen, uh, in particular, once 30 meter or, or 20 to 50 meter telescopes come online in maybe 10, 15 years. So which aspects uh, of these surveys are important for the kinds of things that we're, we'd like to know about? Well, um, lots of things are important. Um, so galaxy positions, magnitudes, colors, spectral energy distributions, shapes, sizes, morphologies, including detailed internal morphologies, the impact of lensing on these galaxies, the impact of the atmosphere and the telescope, and um, scales from sort of very small, which is relevant for object detection and understanding uh, nearby galaxies and how many galaxies you have in individual halos, two very, very large um, scales, which are important for mapping out large-scale galaxy clustering, the matter distribution on large scales. So the size of the surveys is sort of several gigaparsecs, actually many more than several uh, in volume. Um, and the key thing that I want to emphasize is that what we actually have to be able to do is model not just these things individually but actually model the correlations between all of these things. Okay? And that's a totally non-trivial statement. Okay? In order, so you know, if I have you know, a small detailed simulation, I might be able to form a galaxy that looks like a galaxy in the universe. Um, actually, even that is, is hard <laughs> today. Um, but what we really are caring about in this next generation is understanding all of these things and how they interact with each other. And that's important for most of the science that we're actually interested in doing. So unfortunately, what we need to understand is almost everything. Um, and I think this is really, one of the things I want to emphasize is I think that there's really a changing paradigm in the use of simulations in astronomy. And that's part of why we're having this workshop and why you know, even many of you are observers and you're learning some more about some of these simulation tools and the simulators need to learn more about the data um, in lots of gory detail. Um, and you know, I think the old model for, for simulations in astronomy is that you know, simulations provide basic properties. If you're interested in cosmological model, your simulation might provide a halo mass function, might provide a dark matter power spectrum, um, if you're interested in galaxy formation, your simulation might say, well, I've got galaxies at this, th at this redshift, and they're connected to galaxies with these other properties at this other redshift, and that might me help me understand how to connect what I'm seeing in surveys. Um, and of course, simulations have always been a tool for exploring the impact of physical processes and providing basic understanding. And none of these things have gone away. Um, but I think that we really are sort of in a new um, regime where the simulations actually have to be completely integrated into our analysis framework. 
all of the analysis on these next generation surveys, for sure for precision cosmology, but I think also for understanding a lot of the astrophysics, really that analysis has to be done in parallel in, on real and simulated data, just along the lines of the kinds of things that Harard was just talking about and that motivated sort of producing those images um, in the Millennium Observatory. Um, and in many cases, really, we just aren't able to get robust scientific conclusions at the level that we're interested in now without simulations. And so I think it's pretty important to understand how central simulations are going to be in getting to the next level of understanding in cosmology and astrophysics. And just to remind you of some of the basic goals, right, we now have a standard cosmological model. Right? That cosmological model, the basic pieces of it can actually be described by just seven numbers. Um, but there's lots of gory astrophysics that goes into turning those seven numbers into what we see today. And we'd like to know, really, is this model correct in detail? And in order to do that, we really have to be able to make very detailed predictions for what the universe looks like in the context of this model and any alternative model that we're interested in exploring. Right? If you want to test whether lambda CDM is correct or whether um, you know, your favorite dark energy or uh, modified gravity model provides a better uh, fit to the data, you really need to make these kind of detailed predictions and test them against the data. And simulations are the tool that we have to do that. So um, this is a nice movie that was made uh, from a high resolution simulation of a galaxy cluster by Heidi Wu. Um, and uh, what I want to emphasize here is just the kinds of things that you've been hearing about already this morning is that these clumps of dark matter provide the basic uh, building blocks of everything that we see in terms of the galaxy population. And so the first step in all of these things is understanding in detail um, how these dark matter halos grow, evolve, how they're distributed in the universe, how those properties are correlated with each other on a wide range of scales. Um, so these dark matter halos are really the basic unit of structure formation and galaxy formation. And over the last decade or so, we actually have now very precise models to describe the number of dark matter halos as a function of their various properties, mass, other properties, um, how those things are distributed from large scales to small scales. And that provides an understanding of very basic things like the dark matter power spectrum, the number density of galaxy clusters in the universe. It also provides the basic um, framework for galaxy formation. Um, so just emphasizing that, we have this basic paradigm for galaxy formation. Our previous lectures um, talked about this already. Right? Galaxies form in dark matter halos. In this paradigm, we think that every dark matter halo that is massive enough to be able to cool gas and form stars should have a galaxy in it. So then the job of galaxy formation theory is to say, what kind of galaxy should you have as a function of the properties of that dark matter halo? Okay. Um, we know how these dark matter halos form and grow over time, and this controls how the galaxies uh, merge and grow. And most physical processes that might contribute to the, gal to the details of the galaxies that we see are understood at a basic level. But I think it's fair to say that these models are still fairly immature in that their relative importance of various galaxy formation feedback processes, for example, and the interactions between them are still pretty unclear. So you know, you heard Joel talk and, and Harar talk about some analytic models which parametrize these physical prescriptions. Um, and we have a pretty good idea of what those physical prescriptions are. AGN feedback has some impact on massive galaxies. Supernova feedback blows out the gas in, in low mass galaxies. But these models do not yet describe the data that we have at the level of precision 
that we can measure it. None of them are at that level. Okay? So we really need to understand the relative importance and the interactions between these things. And in order to do that, I just want to emphasize that in order to make progress in galaxy formation, we really need to be exploring parameter space. And that has essentially not been happening in the galaxy formation field in any robust way until the last couple of years. Okay? And we are now getting to that stage where both in hydrodynamical simulations and in some analytic models, uh, people actually are starting to explore parameter space um, and test in detail against uh, observational data. And I'll talk more tomorrow about some of the detailed tests one can do. Um, so then I'll just say a few words about dark matter and uh, what we need on the simulation front. Um, so these galaxy surveys, especially with lensing, are mapping out where the dark matter is in precise detail. We actually now have a very good handle on how much dark matter we have in the universe. But determining what it is actually requires much more detailed predictions of the cosmological model. And um, you know, determining what the mass and the cross-section of the dark matter particle is, or if indeed it is a particle, is going to take both particle physics and astrophysics. And the simulation challenge here is actually quite severe. You need to understand, so if we actually measure dark matter, for example, in, in a direct detection experiment, or see its impact um, in the halo of the Milky Way through uh, annihilation of gamma rays, that will be in the Milky Way. Okay, but in order to interpret that, we need to understand the cosmological context of the Milky Way. Is the Milky Way a typical galaxy? Is it like every other galaxy of its mass? What in detail are the properties of this galaxy? And what is the detailed distribution of dark matter in this galaxy? So in order to do that, you need very large cosmological volume in order to understand whether this galaxy is the same as every other galaxy. And in addition, you need to understand very, very small substructures and the impact of baryons. So examples of that include trying to understand why do we have the number of observed uh, satellite galaxies that we have in our Milky Way? Why do those have the luminosities that they have? Um, it includes understanding what, how do the dark matter particles uh, in the Milky Way behave? What are their velocities? And are those impacted by substructure or by baryons? So these things require very high resolution. So this is just an example of one thing that is pushing simulation requirements um, in several directions. Um, on the dark energy side, actually more generally, on the, in, in the regime of all precise cosmology measurements, which include not only dark energy, uh, but also measurements of inflation through details of the power spectrum, measurements of neutrino mass, um, tests distinguishing between a cosmological constant and other explanations for the accelerating universe. Um, there are several cosmological probes that one can do to understand these things. These include galaxy clustering on a wide range of scales. So baryon acoustic oscillations looks at galaxy clustering at about 150 megaparsecs. Um, but you also can get some constraints by comparing very small scale galaxy clustering with other, uh, with other probes. Uh, the galaxy cluster abundance is a sensitive probe of both the evolution of structure and the acceleration of the universe. And so uh, this is another uh, key observable. And then, of course, weak lensing um, test things. Now, what I want to emphasize here is that the main cosmological probes are already or will soon be in the systematics dominated regime. So I mentioned that we have you know, that seven parameter cosmological model. That's just the simplest version. Maybe there's 59 parameters. Um, but in any case, we need to get from those parameters uh, that specify the cosmological model to better than a percent predictions for structure formation and not just the structure formation that we might like to see in our simulation, which is the dark matter, but the, the, the observable tracers, which include, for example, observable properties of clusters, the observable impact of shear on galaxies, observable galaxy clustering, and what properties of the galaxies it depends on. Um, and again, 
the correlations between all of these things. And then there are many, many observational systematics that in some cases can be dominant. So that include things that have to do with your survey, deblending, determining you know, whether, whether one uh, block of light is one galaxy or two, um, photometry, understanding how well have you actually calibrated the light coming from individual objects across very, very wide areas. Um, determining whether things are stars or galaxies is quite important because we expect that those should have very different clustering properties. Um, and just an example, uh, you know, is that one wants to understand in detail the relationship between clusters of galaxies that you see in your survey and dark matter halos. And there are a number of systematic effects that come in there. One example is whether or not you can determine the center of a cluster. Um, so the requirements for making these predictions on the theory side and then taking those theory predictions to the observational plane are very, very stringent if we want to make use of the next generation of data. And this is just an example of, of two such things still in, in theory space. Um, this is looking at the weak lensing power spectrum, and this is looking at requirements on the halo mass function and halo bias. Um, and the bottom line here of this plot is just to say that the current discrepancies between different models are much larger than the measurements that we're going to have from uh, the next generation of surveys. Okay. Um, and so, in particular, on the precision cosmology side, I just want to emphasize that there are lots, there are several goals that actually point to having the sort of same kinds of simulations. Um, and the, the requirements on those simulations are quite stringent. So you want to be able to make precise predictions for a variety of structure formation probes. You want to be able to verify your science codes on simulations that look like the real universe, that have sort of the volume and depth of the kind of surveys that we're going to see in the near future. Um, you want to be able to understand the instrument and observational systematics. Um, you need to understand your error bars. And the simulation requirements for, th for this are actually quite severe. Um, you need to not just simulate the area of the universe that your survey measures, but you need to understand whether that volume is representative. And so quite often, you need to do this a thousand times for a given survey volume. It may not be a thousand times on small scales once we get to the, you know, to the very wide areas probed by LSST. But once you start to think about the covariance between every observable that you're going to want to use, your requirements creep back up. Okay? And um, I've actually, you know, many people have been thinking about this quite hard. What are the actual requirements? And it's really a research question that's unsolved. Um, but it's certainly pushing us to needing to do lots of uh, very precise simulations. Um, and of course, we need to understand the impact of the uncertainties that we currently have in galaxy formation and, and galaxy selection on all of our cosmological probes. Um, OK, so I've told you that you want to simulate um, from 10 to about 100 million galaxies over the whole sky. Um, you want to understand the importance of cosmological models. So you'd like to do this in many different cosmologies. You want to understand the impact of galaxy formation physics. So you better be able to marginalize over all of your uncertainties in galaxy formation physics. Uh, you want to be able to include all observational systematics that might be relevant. Um, and you want to do this to better than a percent accuracy for many different cosmological observables, and of course you want to do this in more volume than is observed. Okay, so sounds like just one PhD thesis, right? <laughs> um, okay, so it's, it's great job security. <laughs> so we have lots of things to do, so that makes it fun. Um, so I'm just going to talk about how can we make a stab at solving pieces of this problem since probably we can't solve the whole thing um, by the end of this workshop. Um, OK, so 
Uh, first, let me just say a few words about some simulations. Um, I, Joel has already, Joel and Harard already talked about uh, various simulation aspects. So this is just a handful of simulation projects that I've been involved in. You've already heard about the Bolshoi simulation, um, which is a very nice simulation that resolves most of the galaxies that we see, for example, uh, sort of typical 0.1 L star galaxies in Sloan, resolves those quite well over a, a similar volume to what Sloan does. Um, but that's nowhere near the volume that you'd like to be able to get, and so uh, one can do large realizations. Um, in this case, the Las Damas uh, suite of simulations, we did 200 simulations, 50 each of 40 different boxes to try to understand more about the sample variance and the, and the uh, covariance between various observables. Um, sometimes you can get a better handle on the problem by picking specific regions that you're interested in simulating and simulating them with higher resolution. And the Rhapsody simulations are a suite of about 100 massive galaxy clusters that Heidi Wu, who's here, uh, did for her PhD thesis at Stanford. And the papers on that will be coming out in the next week or two. Um, and here, the goal was to actually get a statistically relevant sample of clusters where we could still resolve the subhalos hosting the galaxies. So um, <clears throat> this slide just is an example of some of the largest simulations that have ever been done. Harard already told you about the Millennium XXL simulation. I, I believe this is still currently the largest simulation done in terms of the total number of particles. About 300 billion particles were in this Millennium XXL simulation, um, which is totally awesome and fantastic, but unfortunately is still pretty low resolution for getting the detailed properties of galaxies that we'd like to get. Okay? And so in some cases, I mentioned this re-simulation uh, possibility. You can zoom in on an individual region and do that with, with um, many more particles. And there's been a handful of simulations that have done this with of order a billion particles in individual dark matter halos. And that's very, very useful for understanding the details of how substructures go over many orders of, of magnitude. Um, but we're still in the regime where we actually can't solve all of this problem at once. So we have to pick pieces of it that we think we can solve um, and pick those pieces judiciously since, it's, uh, since the simulations are quite expensive. Um, yeah? Twenty-one gigaparsecs. Okay. Okay, great, so there's now one bigger simulation. Um, okay, so just to reemphasize my point um, about dark matter halos, that dark matter halos are really the basic unit of structure formation and galaxy formation. So if you want to populate a simulation with galaxies, the first thing that you want to do is just resolve the dark matter halos for the galaxies that you want to model. Sounds, uh, sounds easy enough, and then figure out how those galaxies are related to the dark matter halos. Um, but of course, we know also that galaxies don't just live in large dark matter halos, they also live in dark matter substructures. And so you also would like to resolve the dark matter halos and the substructures for all of the galaxies that you want to model properly. And of course, you've already heard from the last two speakers that you know, galaxies are built up in a series of mergers. In, in this, uh, in this uh, merger tree, the dashed lines are after the things become subhalos. Um, and 
So what you actually want to be able to do is resolve dark matter halos and substructures and merger histories for the galaxies uh, that you want to model properly. OK, so maybe our goal of simulating 100 billion galaxies is not so easy. Um, OK, so let me just review some possible ways we could approach this modeling of galaxies. So um, one way is to try to do full hydrodynamical uh, simulations that not only simulate the dark matter, but also simulate the gas physics. And this is definitely what you would like to be able to do, right? You definitely would like to be able to do this, and you'd like to be able to do this and produce realistic galaxies that have things uh, that, that look like galaxies in our real universe and do this over large volumes. Um, unfortunately, we're really not in the regime where we can do hydrodynamical simulations that resolve detailed galaxy populations in the volumes of next generation surveys. So there's been a lot of progress on, on this front recently, and in particular, when people focus on individual galaxies. Um, you know, people have now done very high resolution simulations of individual galaxies like the Milky Way. You can actually do this so that you get to high enough uh, resolution that you, you resolve every substructure for an individual galaxy that was ever massive enough to form stars. There are still some uh, processes that are below the resolution scale that have to be approximated uh, by various recipes. So lots of progress here, but nowhere near the regime where we can do this for large surveys. Um, so both Joel and, and Harard already talked about semi-analytic models. You'll have three lectures on that, uh, I think, by Darren Croton and that and related things. So I'm not going to talk a lot more about uh, semi-analytic models in, in my lectures. but. The idea here is what you'd like to be able to do is in, in those, the simulation requirements are basically that you want to be able to resolve the full merger history of these galaxies in simulations. There are analytic methods for, um, for producing merging histories, but I think they're not accurate enough to get to um, the next level that we'd like to be able to get to. Um, and then there are various empirical methods for producing galaxy distributions. So if, for example, you say, well, I don't care what galaxy formation physics produces um, the galaxy population. I just want to use these things as tracers of the matter distribution. Or if you say, well, I do care what galaxy formation physics is, but I can't get there until I understand this galaxy halo connection, then you might want to start by developing detailed empirical models that actually allow you, you to, to just um, parameterize this galaxy halo connection um, and, and constrain it with data. So uh, three different kinds of empirical models which would have different resolution requirements. So one, which Joel mentioned already, is this idea called subhalo abundance matching, where you put a galaxy in every dark matter halo, including substructures. Okay. The second is just halo occupation. So you resolve all of the halos that you expect to host galaxies. Okay, above some, say, luminosity threshold or stellar mass threshold. Don't care about whether that, that those halos are resolved with lots of substructure because you don't care about their substructures. You just put them in statistically. Or you can say, well, I really want to be able to resolve, I really want to be able to simulate large volumes that look like my surveys, and so I'm going to approximate this any way I can. And for some things, you might be able to get away with not even resolving the halos very well, but just using um, smoothed uh, properties of the dark matter distribution. So the resolution requirements depend on the method, as I've indicated here, and I'll say a bit more about. The correlations also may depend on the method. And this is something that needs to be understood, I think, as we move forward. So an example here is that in the halo occupation scheme, one basically says that there's some probability of having galaxies with some property given, for example, generally this is ju just given the mass of the halo. Okay? So then you're ignoring any correlations between any other property of the halo and the properties of the galaxy. Now, in principle, those can also be put in, but one then has to think through those details. Um, and then, of course, what you can infer about these depends on the method. If you don't have any prescription for 
you know, for supernova feedback in your model, then you're not going to be able to infer anything about what those parameters are. Um, but of course, in order to do that, you're really, even in the more physical models, you really need to be exploring parameter space. OK, so I'll say more about some of these methods, both today and, and tomorrow. Um, OK, so as we already heard, the first step is to find the halos and figure out how they grow over time. And since you already heard some stuff about this, I won't say a lot more right now. Um, Peter Beruzzi, uh, over the last year or so, developed two very useful tools which are now publicly available. Um, one is a halo finder, which finds halos in phase space um, and works very well on large simulations. Um, the second is a merger tree code, which connects halos between snapshots. And as far as we're aware, this is the first merger tree code that actually explicitly checks for gravitational consistency between snapshots. That is, we not only look for the halos in phase space, we actually assure that you know, halos follow paths that allow them to end up in, uh, in, the, in their descendant halos, which cleans up a lot of the messy uh, things that can happen in, in these kinds of uh, algorithms. And so just a few more words about this halo finder. Um, it's very accurate. It uses phase space uh, information and time, and so um, has very accurate tracking of substructures and major mergers. Um, it scales to very large simulations. So it's fast, it's memory efficient, and it can run on thousands of processors. Um, it's been run so far on uh, Bolshoi, uh, last week on Milli Millennium, and you'll, you'll get a chance to play around with that uh, tomorrow during the session. It's run on Multidark, the Las Damas simulations I mentioned, and also on these very high resolution re-simulations like Aquarius and Rhapsody. Um, so Peter will be going over this uh, with you tomorrow, and I think one of the very interesting things will be, for example, to compare the output of this code with other codes. You can play around with defining halos, of course, Halos are, there, there was a nice paper on the archive today showing that our definitions of halos are, are all wrong. Um, <laughs> so um, so lots of, lots of uh, interesting things we can do uh, playing around with this um, in the hands-on session tomorrow. OK, so now I want to talk more about the, how galaxies are connected to dark matter halos. So the main point here is that because halos are the building block, the way to think about how galaxies populate the universe is to first think about how they populate halos. And um, just to make sure everybody's on the same page with definitions, right? we have a massive host halo, which people vary in their definition of what, what, cause, what is the definition of this boundary. But it is generally defined by some overdensity criteria. And the overdensity criteria that one uses is a, somewhat a matter of taste and of much debate. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but in practice, as long as you do something self-consistent, it, it might be OK. Um, and then, of course, you have low mass subhalos that are just kind of sitting by themselves out here in the void. And then you have subhalos, which are within the virial radius of larger halos. Okay. So the first question you can ask when you ask about how galaxies populate dark matter halos is just ask, how do subhalos populate dark matter host halos? And um, the first serious study of this with large statistics uh, was done uh, by us in this paper several years ago now, where we just looked at uh, what is the average number of halos as a function of the halo mass. And it turns out that this functional form is quite generic. Okay? If you look over dark matter uh, simulations over sort of any range of simulations, if you make some cut on the properties of your substructures, you get something that looks like this. So this, what is this telling you? It's just telling you that above some mass, you'll get, um, you'll get one uh, central galaxy. That's this red line. This is smooth because we didn't cut on halo mass to do this, we cut on some other property. In this case, it was uh, just the Vmax of the, the maximum circular velocity of the, of the halos. Um, but but how, how smooth this falls off will depend on what property you use and how much that scatters with the host halo mass. And then 
uh, almost completely generically about a factor of 15 to 20 larger than this minimum mass for hosting one galaxy is where you start to get roughly two galaxies. And you get roughly a power law distribution of satellite galaxies with a power that, as far as I can tell, is still completely equivalent to one for all galaxy samples that are actually luminosity selected. It may not be true uh, once we get to higher precision. But it's still true that uh, this scales roughly as n to the mass of the host halo. So you should think of this as just a physically motivated way of characterizing the relationship between dark matter clumps and the underlying dark matter distribution. Okay? And we know how many halos there are in simulations. We have well good analytic prescriptions for how many halos there are. We have good analytic prescriptions based on uh, numerical simulations in many cosmologies for how those halos cluster. Right, so that's just the halo mass function and the halo bias function. Okay, this is just the large scale clustering of halos, um, clustering of halos on large scales compared to the clustering of dark matter on the same scale. Okay, and this is uh, the, the x axis here is dark matter peak height, but that just corresponds to halo mass. Okay, and these, these functions are actually directly related. I'm not going to go into the, the theory of that, but you can see that. This, there's sort of a characteristic mass here where you start getting fewer and fewer dark matter halos. It has roughly a power law at low mass and then an exponential fall off. And at that same characteristic mass in the clustering, you see that halos become much more clustered. Okay. Um, and there are some analytic functions that, that, uh, that predict this, but in detail they actually those are not good enough to do from first principles. They're really just calibrated from simulations. And they're sort of, I would say, currently at roughly the 10% level, 5% um, level in some cases um, for individual cosmologies. But we really need to get both of these to higher precision than they are now. OK, so what does this have to do with my galaxy uh, population? So the basic idea of this whole, uh, so there's sort of a whole industry now called the halo occupation uh, approach. And the basic idea is that you say, OK, I've got uh, dark matter halos. I know their number density, and I know how they cluster as a function of their mass. And then I've got some distribution of galaxies in those halos. And uh, this word HOD stands for halo occupation distribution. That just means the number of some object as a function of some property of the halo. Most often, it's the number of some object above some given luminosity threshold or stellar mass threshold as a function of the mass of the halo. But this, this is a generic framework. You could, in principle, have this be conditional on other properties of the halo. And it could be, you could be talking about other uh, properties of the galaxy. So if you want to specify, for example, something more than the number, and you want to, for example, specify the full luminosity function of galaxies as a function of their mass, um, that's sometimes called the conditional luminosity function. So again, that's just saying, given that I have a halo of mass m, what is the probability that I have a given luminosity function of galaxies in that mass halo? Okay. So that specifies what galaxies go in there. And then you have to say, how are those galaxies put into the halo? So you say something about the density distribution of those galaxies and halos. In observations, it appears that galaxies do very close to trace the dark matter distribution that, than uh, in, in dark matter halos. OK, so these two things combine the halo statistics and the relationship of galaxies to halos predict the galaxy abundance and the galaxy clustering. So if you go out and measure the galaxy clustering, um, this is an example of the two-point function uh, calculated from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, this is actually from a few years ago. It's now. Uh, much more precise than this. And you then model this correlation function with some HOD that has some set of parameters that's motivated by what I just told you about the population between uh, of galaxies, of, of substructures and their host halos. Okay? And then you can infer how those galaxies uh, populate the halos. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And actually, in the hands-on session, I'm going to provide a code that allows you to do this yourself so that you can uh, play around with this. Um, OK, but you also, 
In this case, we ignored the substructure information. But of course, that is a, a prediction of the simulations if those simulations are high enough resolution. So you'd like to be able to use that as well. And that's this idea of subhalo abundance matching. And so the basic idea is that there's one galaxy in every halo, including every subhalo. If you just put one galaxy in every host halo, you'll get it drastically wrong. Your clustering on small scales will be uh, much too low because we know that there are more galaxies in clusters, for example, than just the, the most massive system. Um, and so the basic idea is the simplest idea you could imagine. You take the most massive galaxy in some volume and you put it in the most massive halo. And you go on down the line. Um, so this basic approach appears to work very, very, very well. Um, if we do simulations of lambda CDM, like, for example, the, the Bolshoi simulation that, uh, that Joel just told you about, and we identify halos precisely, and we figure out which halo property we should be using for this assignment, and we figure out in detail what that assignment should be. It may be one-to-one, -one, or it may be one-to-one -one with some scatter. Okay? Um, but with a handful of parameters, we can uh, reproduce many galaxy statistics. So uh, this is a paper uh, by my student, Rachel Reddick, which will appear on the archive tonight, um, showing the galaxy clustering. This is uh, the projected two-point function, WP of RP as a function of scale. Uh, the blue points here are the Sloan points from DR7, and the black uh, points are this model based on putting a galaxy, oh, sorry, other way around. Uh, based on putting galaxies in dark matter halos and substructures. Okay, so the top set of panels shows you the correlation function. The bottom set of panels shows you the conditional stellar mass function. So what was done here was to go to both the data and the simulation, identify galaxy groups with the same galaxy group finding code, and look at the distribution of luminosities in those galaxy groups. So the, the a label here shows sort of the inferred halo mass, but it's actually the observed uh, property is the total stellar mass in all of the galaxies. So this is all done in observational space. Um, and you can see the model and the data uh, are in near perfect agreement. Um, if you just look by eye, you can't tell the difference. Um, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is just a movie uh, that shows on one half of this are real Sloan galaxies, and on the other half of this are the um, halos that we've identified as galaxies with the same selection criteria. Um, and if you come to Stanford, you can see this in 3D on our, on our VizLab wall. Um, OK, so I told you this really simple story, but it turns out that the details matter. Um, I want to show you a couple more plots from, from Rachel's paper, because they relate to this question of how well do we need to do in order to, to, what simulations we need in order to get to the next generation. Um, so one could imagine choosing ma many kinds of halo properties to say this is the thing that is most tightly associated with the galaxy properties. And it turns out if you choose the wrong one, then you will get the wrong relationship between central uh, galaxies and satellite galaxies. Okay, and so in these plots, the black points are the data, and the rainbow points are various labels that the halo finder spits out for the same set of halos. Okay, so same halo finder. I've just labeled all of the halos with different labels. Some of those are based on the circular velocity. Some of them are based on mass. Some of them, for satellite galaxies, use the properties of those satellite halos today. And some of them trace them back using the merger tree and look at what their maximum property ever was. So that actually is sort of physically what you would expect. You would expect if you, for example, are associating some halo property with stellar mass, you might expect that you know, when things are central galaxies, they continue to form stars. And then at some point, when a galaxy gets close to a massive cluster, its dark matter starts to get stripped. But its stellar mass is unlikely to get impacted in the same way that its dark matter does. And in fact, those, uh, those satellite galaxies can hang around for a long time when their dark matter is significantly stripped, um, 
without impacting their stellar mass. So what we find is actually that really the only way to match the data is if you assign those galaxy properties to the maximum circular velocity that the halo ever had in its history. Okay? But what this is really telling us is that the data is putting very, very tight constraints on what the relationship between satellite galaxies and central galaxies is and what the relationship is between the properties of the galaxy and the properties of the halo. Um, and you can also put constraints on how much scatter you have. If you put more scatter, you will bring in more low mass halos, so you'll impact the clustering. You will also impact the properties of central galaxies in groups. If you have no scatter, then obviously you will see no scatter in those, in those properties um, when you bin on group mass. And so at the end of the day, in this approach, again, with the same simulation, calculating many, many models and exploring this parameter space, we find that uh, there's really a very tight range of parameters. This is, this is actually just a two-parameter model. Right? We looked at one lambda CDM simulation, and the only parameters we considered were, after we, after we determine which property is the most relevant, we ask, uh, how much does that dark matter halo need to be stripped before you stop calling it a galaxy above that mass threshold, and how much scatter is there? Um, but you get very tight constraints, and you basically are able to match the data. But let's remind ourselves that this was done in a very small volume. So all of this was done in comparison to the Sloan spectroscopic survey for, um, for galaxies that are brighter than about minus 19 in R band. And so it's a small volume. It's roughly comparable to the volume we simulated with Bolshoi. Um, but that was a pretty expensive simulation. Joel already told you that was, uh, took 6 million CPU hours. And actually, after we did this study, we found that the resolution requirements were much more stringent than we thought. Um, if you really care about getting the substructure fraction right using these kinds of techniques, even this simulation can only really model robustly galaxies above 10 to the 10 solar masses. So if you think you can model all of the substructures analytically after they get destroyed in the simulations, you can definitely push this farther because you can get about two orders of magnitude further down with this simulation if you only care about galaxies in the field. Um, but if you care about the substructures, um, very, very uh, strong resolution requirements. And this was uh, a simulation that's obviously nowhere near the volumes that we just talked about in terms of the next um, generation of surveys. So, and just to remind you, you always want more simulation volume than you've observed to understand your error bars. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, tomorrow. Um, one, one way to do that is just to uh, simulate large volumes. I mentioned already this specific suite of simulations. This was done to be able to produce uh, catalogs that look like Sloan that can give you about 100 spectroscopic surveys for Sloan using HOD methods. So not resolving the substructures, just resolving the host halos. Our highest resolution simulation is about an order of magnitude worse in mass resolution than Bolshoi. Um, but we actually can produce statistics. And there's a set of Galaxy Mock catalogs that's been produced uh, from this uh, that's been available for a couple years. Actually, it will be updated, uh, I think, in about a month with the final mock catalogs from this uh, set of simulations. Um, but actually, the simulations that you would really like to even model existing surveys don't exist. As I've sort of explained here, you know, with these very high resolution simulations, we can get the spectroscopic survey, one of them. <laughs> and what we really want is to be able to, even today, model the full uh, Sloan survey with photometry, which is much, much more volume than the spectroscopic survey. And remember that in the next decade or so, you're going to want to model surveys that um, are about five magnitudes fainter. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, next uh, tomorrow about some of the methods that uh, we might be able to use to be able to achieve this. Um, and I'll just put up this very complicated plot uh, to think about a little bit uh, to make this point a little bit more concrete in terms of what we need. 
actually, it, so there's, there's three sets of three lines on this plot. Actually, there's, so the, the diagonal lines just indicate the kind of uh, simulation you can produce if you have this many particles. Okay, so we heard about Millennium XXL, which is about six some thousand cubed simulations. And if you treat these simulations as an observer at the corner of the box uh, simulating an octant of sky, you can get out to this redshift um, using this particle mass. So Millennium XXL is sort of in this regime, gets you uh, particles at a you know, few 10 to the 10 out to redshift of a little beyond two if you treat it in this way. Uh, Bolshoi has mass resolution of about 10 to the 8, but only gets you the very local universe. Okay, um, And so all of these triangles are various simulations that have been done. Um, if you care about, if you want to just resolve the host halos and not the substructures, then the lines to look at are these dashed lines. And the three lines correspond roughly to an R-band magnitude limited survey of minus 21, minus 20, and minus 18. Um, so the kinds of things people are talking about doing cosmology with in the next generation of, of uh, simulations are roughly corresponding to the green line, I'd say. But in terms of what produces the background population, you actually want to go well below the red lines. So already Sloan, of course, in the nearby universe has galaxies dimmer than this. Um, and with DES, LSST, we will have many, many galaxies uh, dimmer than this that will provide background that might be correlated with our signal that we need to understand. Um, and uh, I put these abundance match lines on here, but this plot was actually made about a year ago before we completed uh, Rachel's work. And I would actually, whoops, now say that those uh, dotted lines, if you really want to do it right, are about an order of magnitude more stringent than I would claim here if you want to get the, the robust substructure population. And so uh, one thing that you can do to try to approximate this in regimes where, where you don't think you can do the full problem is to just use the dark matter density. Um, and that's a technique we've developed to be able to uh, do these very large surveys. I think in the end you're going to want to use a hybrid of these techniques, thinking about what's, more, what's appropriate where. Um, with this, with, if you really, really push your resolution with just using the dark matter density, you can get here and then you can actually try to resolve something like, you know, like the DES with a reasonable size simulation so that you can do it many, many, many times. So uh, that's just a basic picture. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more uh, tomorrow about the kind of simulation pipeline that we're, we've developed for the dark energy survey simulations and will be used for other future surveys. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about how we produce these simulations for upcoming surveys, how we compare simulations to data and use simulations to interpret data. Uh, just as a reminder, tomorrow afternoon you'll have a hands-on session on, on halo finding and I think merger trees if you choose to. And, and on Thursday I'll have some specific examples of sort of creating and, and using these kind of galaxy catalogs. So, thanks. Questions? Mike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a so so if you want to resolve these galaxies, then this is the mass particle that you need. And then if you want to see how far out in redshift, that's the minimum mass particle you need. And then if you want to see how far out in redshift you get, you bring this to the line of the simulation that you run. And that tells you. Right. Yes. Exactly. Or you can do more. And I'll say a little bit more about that tomorrow. 
<laughs> yes, the paper's been in prep for 10 years, but it will be coming out this summer. <laughs> um, I, I'll, tell, I'll tell you more about it tomorrow. Yeah, because I'll describe the simulations we've been doing for, for DES um, using this technique tomorrow. Other questions? Okay. Thanks.